So again, this is a lecture on gliomas. And um, this is a good table to start with, particularly for the residents. So this is the most recent WHO classification of CNS tumors. This was published in 2016. And most of the CNS tumors that we deal with are gliomas, in fact, and we'll go through sort of the um, top hitters on the coming slides. But uh, grossly and roughly, you can classify them first into astrocytic and oligodendral uh, dendroglial tumors. And so these are tumors that arise from astrocytomas or oligodendrocytes. Then you have uh, these uh, sort of mixed bag of um, also astrocytic tumors, but ones that are uh, far less common, especially in the adult population, things like pilocytic astrocytomas, uh, subependable giant cell astrocytomas, particularly for tuber sclerosis patients pleomorphic xanthroastrocytomas and, and the anaplastic version thereof, so PXAs. So these are all uh, astrocytomas and thus by definition gliomas and, and the topic of conversation today, but less common. Another uh, special sort of subtype of these CNS uh, gliomas is this diffuse midline glioma that's defined by the H3K27M mutation. This is a relatively recent discovery in the last five to seven years. And uh, this population of tumors that meets this metric is, uh, by definition, a midline tumor, so something in the thalamus or brainstem. Appendimal tumors are also uh, fall under the umbrella of gliomas, and so these are tumors that arise from the ependema, uh, the most malignant of which are anaplastic ependymomas, but there are also grade one benign variants like subependymomas. And we'll talk about mixopapillary ependymomas, which recently got an upgrade from grade one to grade two. Other sort of strange gliomas that we see maybe once or twice a year in tumor board are cordoid gliomas of the anterior third ventricle, astroblastomas. These are uh, one-offs. There's really not a lot of literature about them because, uh, because of how rare they are. Choroid plexus tumors are uh, not gliomas by definition, but fall under the neuroepithelial tumor umbrella. And so you'll see them in the big WHO CNS uh, tumor classification. And then you get to the neuronal and mixed neural uh, glial tumors. And so some of these are gliomas because they have glial components and some of them are neuronal tumors. And so they are under the big neuroepithelial umbrella, but not the glioma sub umbrella. And almost always uh, most of these lesions are grade one lesions and, and benign and surgically curable. And so we'll talk about those in the coming slides. Other CNS tumors that we're not going to discuss today because they're not gliomas or uh, uh, pineal tumors and embryonal tumors like medullos and, uh, and then tumors of the cranial nerves uh, like schwannomas. And so we'll talk about the most common glioma subtypes now. So grade one tumors, as I said, uh, the most common ones that we might see are a polycytic astrocytoma, uh, subependable giant cell astrocytomas and glial neural tumors are um, are other grade one tumors uh, within this subset. If you uh, have a pediatric uh, practice, you're going to see uh, many more polycytic astrocytomas. If you have an adult practice, you'll probably see a similar number of mixed glial neural and polycytic astrocytomas, both being rare in general. And then if you have a big epilepsy practice or have a, have a, a concentration of tuber sclerosis patients, then you might see uh, more uh, SEGAs or subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. Other grade one tumors that uh, are often in the differential of uh, glial neoplasms but are not uh, uh, strictly gliomas um, or at least not plain gliomas by themselves are DNETs, so disembryoblastic uh, neuroepithelial tumors. These often present with seizures, ganglios. Uh, cytomas, which have neuronal components, ganglioglomas, which have mixed neuronal and glial components, and then dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma, which is also known as Lermine Duclos disease, which is uh, a type of predominantly harmatomatous lesion uh, that arises in patients with P10 mutations. And if you have a somatic mutation in P10, you'll get Lermine Duclos. If you have a germline mutation, you'll get Cowden syndrome. But the CNS consequence of that is that you can get these kinds of gangliocytomas. These, that's, this is not a glioma, and neither is the DNET or the gangliocytoma, but it's important to uh, have in this discussion because, again, in the radiographic differential, you'll often have this and this and a couple of other things, so you want to know how to address those. Grade two gliomas, 
Uh, most common ones are oligodendrogliomas and astrocytomas in middle-aged and younger patients. Uh, pendymomas have both a grade two and a grade three uh, phenotype, and so uh, that's another common grade two pen, uh, glioma in adults. And then pleomorphic xanthroastrocytomas or PXAs. Cerebellar neurocytomas, uh, central neurocytomas, excuse me, and cerebellar liponeurocytomas are other grade two tumors. Central neurocytomas are the classic avidly enhancing lesion that arises off of the septum uh, of the lateral ventricles. And so uh, while this is not a glioma, it may be in your differential for intraventricular tumors. Uh, that also includes a glioma differential. So important to know about that entity. And cerebellar liponeurocytomas are a, a rare, um, uh, predominantly neuronal based uh, cerebellar tumor. Um, I think I've seen one in the past seven years, but um, good to good to know about its existence. And then grade three gliomas are basically just the anaplastic versions of all of uh, the grade two lesions. So an anaplastic oligo, anaplastic astrocytoma, and anaplastic ependymoma. And the prognostic implications are uh, different based on um, the histology. We'll talk about that. And then grade four gliomas, there's basically two that are important for this discussion, glioblastoma, which we all know is the most common malignant tumor, malignant primary tumor in the brain, and then this H3K27M mutant uh, diffuse midline glioma. Those are the, the common ones that we see in the adult population. So I said that this was the 2016 WHO CNS update, and soon after that came out, a couple years later, they said that there's going to be a 2020 update um, based uh, on molecular uh, features. The WHO classification uh, is moving heavily towards molecular um, uh, classification of tumors and away from just basic histology. Uh, but the 2020 uh, WHO classification has yet to come out, and so now they're saying it's the 2021 uh, one, but the neuropathologists here still tell us that they're not exactly sure when it's going to come out. And so as part of this issue of uh, the molecular um, knowledge uh, coming out relatively quickly and then the WHO updates not coming out soon enough, um, there has been this uh, these guidelines called the C-IMPACT NOW guidelines, which take the molecular uh, data that's uh, being presented and published in the literature and sort of updates the WHO classification on a less formal but more current basis. And so uh, there's been several uh, C-IMPACT NOW uh, updates since the WHO 2016 um, publication, uh, but a few of the important ones, we don't have to go through all of them, are that uh, now if you have the H3K27M mutation, you're only considered grade four if you also have a diffuse midline glioma. So they had found a few cases of uh, non-midline uh, gliomas with this mutation, and then previously this mutation would render them all grade four lesions. But now that's restricted only to the gliomas that are uh, within the midline. And it's thought that if you have this mutation, but you don't have a midline glioma. We don't really know what that means in terms of uh, the aggressiveness not or not of your tumor because it's a rel relatively rare event with uh, data forthcoming. Um, next is that if you have an IDH mutant astrocytoma uh, with ATRX loss and P53 positivity, you can just call it an astrocytoma. You don't have to do 1P19Q analysis to eliminate oligo. Um, that's not perhaps as important for us as neurosurgeons, but important for the neuropathologist uh, in terms of their algorithm and workup. If you have a diffuse astrocytoma that's IDH wild type, but you don't have the traditional histologic criteria for GBM, i.e. no necrosis or microvascular proliferation. If you have a CDKN 2A, 2B deletion or EGFR amplification or a TERP promoter mutation, you're uh, basically uh, considered to be a GBM and, and that's again in the absence of microvascular proliferation or necrosis. And so that's important because, for example, in the last couple of years, there's been a trial uh, that Lilly uh, sponsored for patients with this CDK and 2A, 2B deletion, but you needed to be a GBM. And so by this C impact now update, even if you didn't have the histologic criteria, you could, you could uh, be a candidate for the trial. A few sort of minor things. Now they use uh, Arabic numbers instead of Roman numerals. So if you're writing a manuscript about gliomas, just Arabic numerals, which is nice. And then many years ago, 
they uh, modified the WHO classification so that if you had an oligodendroglioma, the worst grade you would ever be uh, designated was a grade three tumor. That's even if you had microvascular proliferation, necrosis, et cetera. Um, but the, the same was not uh, sort of uh, conveyed for astrocytomas. But in this uh, most this May 2020 update, if you're an IDH mutant astrocytoma, the worst grade you can be is a grade three tumor. Uh, you can only be a glioblastoma if you're IDH wild type, i.e. the traditional de novo GBM. And so this is important when we start to look at data and classify uh, patients and look for PFS and OS so that we don't have selection biases. Um, and then I said that mixopapillary tumors got an upgrade. And so we've all, I think, experienced the uh, errant bad mixopapillary tumor, perhaps one that hemorrhage, one that presented with drop meds. Um, and they don't all behave like nice, clean grade one lesions where you resect them and, and it's curative and you're done. And so to reflect this um, more aggressive clinical uh, biology that happens not rarely, uh, Mixopaps got an upgrade to grade two lesion in, in July of last year. Uh, ependymomas is particularly important for uh, the pediatric neurosurgeons and anyone who wants to go into peds or uh, subclassified into type A and type B uh, in the last five to seven years. And um, this is important because uh, these subtypes perform differently um, in terms of long-term clinical behavior. And so, especially in pediatrics where there's a move to uh, de-escalate the radiation doses, there's talks about uh, clinical trials from the, clinical, the, from the children's oncology group about um, stratifying patients based on type A, type B, and uh, decreasing the radiation dose accordingly for the lower risk kids. This is uh, for the residents, just really good numbers to have in your back pocket, especially as you're uh, seeing patients. And so uh, if patients ask you sort of rough numbers, there's about 80,000 new cases of primary brain tumors uh, annually in the US. And of those approximately one third are malignant and two thirds are benign. The most common malignant tumor of course is a glioma. Uh, malignant being the grade two to four lesions in general, and then the most common benign tumor is a meningioma. Uh, age, some epidemiology uh, numbers. These are all pulled from Citrus, which is an excellent resource for uh, for CNS tumor epidemiology in general and glioma specifically. But the age-adjusted incidence rates for all gliomas are about four and a half to five and a half per hundred thousand persons, and then glioblastoma. It's 0.6 to 3.7, not an epidemiologist, but uh, I trust their data. Astrocytomas increase in incidence with age. Oligodendrogliomas have a sweet spot in the 30 to 40 uh, year age group. In general, gliomas are more common in men than women. And there has not been any significant increase in incidence rates over the past 30 years, although people like to um, talk about that and, and uh, cell phones and this, that, and the other. This table um, is a bit scrambled, uh, and so I don't want to pour over the numbers because I think when they put it in the manuscript, it didn't quite translate properly. But this is uh, combined data from the Austrian uh, Brain Tumor Registry, Citrus, which is ours, um, and several other groups. And I just put this out there to say that if you're writing a paper about gliomas, you can find this kind of uh, data. Uh, this is published in Neural Oncology. Um, to pull uh, incidence rates from. This is a good table that did translate well. And so this is uh, glioma epidemiology and survival. And so this looks at the most common sort of glioma subtypes, positics and astrocytomas, GBMs, all of those. And, um, and then uh, gives us data from the US, uh, UK, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Central Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, and and Korea provides uh, data on some, but not all of these uh, subtypes. But so, so this is an important uh, thing that you can pull out if your patients ask you what's the five-year survival rate for uh, glioblastoma, it's, it's 4.7%. And uh, what's the five-year survival rate for an oligo, it's 79%. What's the five-year survival once it's an anaplastic oligo, 50%. And so, this is a, a really good, helpful table to commit some of these numbers to memory. And polycytics, five-year survival of you know, basically 95% in the US. And so let's talk about uh, sort of surgical goals and what 
uh, these gliomas look like. Some of this is uh, more for the junior residents, um, and some for the for the senior residents, but I hope that it's useful for everybody. So uh, grade one gliomas, we see the common types are these mixed uh, glioneural tumors, pilocytic astrocytomas, so pendulum giant cell astrocytomas, and then other things that are in the differential that may look like one of these, but are not strictly uh, necessarily gliomas or DNets and gangliocytomas and uh, Lermy Ducrot's disease. And so the most common presentation for grade one glioma is seizure or headache. Uh, these, by definition, are non infiltrating lesions. They often have uh, quite bright uh, contrast enhancing, uh, but then also many, non many portions of the lesion that are non contrast enhancing. And they're often mixed cystic and solid components. And so if you see a uh, lesion in clinic with a mural nodule and a cyst, even though part of it's enhancing, uh, that's uh, usually a positive sign and often indicative of a grade one glioma in the right uh, clinical setting, right age group, et cetera. And so the surgical goal for uh, grade one gliomas is a gross total section of both the enhancing and non-enhancing disease. And you need to evaluate the cyst wall for enhancement. So if the cyst wall enhances, then uh, we believe that that cyst wall uh, contains active tumor cells, and so it should be removed. And if the cyst wall does not enhance, then it's reactive and can be left alone. And so uh, two sort of examples of that are classic polycytic astrocytoma. Usually the cyst wall enhances and requires some degree of resection versus a hemangioblastoma where you have a neural nodule and a cyst, uh, and the cyst wall typically does not enhance, does not have any tumor in it, and it should be left alone. In general, uh, gross total resection of a grade one glioma is curative, but I put an asterisk there because every now and then one of these will go bad, and so it doesn't mean that you don't need to follow the patient long term. Uh, but in general, uh, it's curative for most patients. So here's a, a 60 something year old man who presented with dizziness and was found to have this lesion in his midline posterior fossa arising from the vermis. And you can see a nodule and a cystic portion and a cyst wall that enhances. And then you can see more of the sort of non-enhancing disease on this flare sequence. And, uh, and this was a polycytic astrocytoma of the vermis. And he underwent uh, gross oral resection and did well. This is uh, not a glioma, uh, but this is low meat Duclos disease, and it's just such a striking example that I thought I might share it with you guys. Uh, I've only had to operate on this once uh, ever. I didn't see it operated on at all during the course of my residency, but, uh, but this patient presented with this large uh, cerebellar lesion, has this very classic tiger striping appearance. And they had mass effect on the brainstem and a face when it was fourth ventricle and it's hydrocephalic. And so we did an ETV and then uh, later resected this lesion, which came back as Lemmy Duclo disease. And as it turned out, when I sent him for gene testing, he had a germline P10 mutation. And so he has Cowden syndrome and, um, and has several other systemic uh, tumors that are being monitored. Grade two, three gliomas. Uh, so this is the stuff that we see all the time in the adult practice. Most common ones are oligos, astrocytomas, ependymomas. Uh, less common are like a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, PXA. Probably see that a few times a year, but not more. And then the anaplastic versions of the above, anaplastic oligos, astros, ependymomas, and anaplastic PXAs. And the presentation here is similar to the grade 1 glioma, most typically seizure or headache. But unlike a grade one glioma, these are infiltrating lesions, and so uh, they cannot be surgically cured. And grade two lesions are typically non-contrast enhancing, i.e. they don't have their own neovascularity yet, and blood-brain barrier breakdown yet. And grade three lesions are typically contrast enhancing, at least have patchy areas of enhancing of enhancement. And the surgical goal for grade two, three gliomas is gross total resection of the enhancing and non-enhancing disease. Uh, while maintaining the KPS. And so it's a careful balance between the neurologic and oncologic goals. But if you believe that you can take the enhancing and non-enhancing disease out, there's data to say that that uh, is better. Uh, surgery is, uh, as I said, typically not curative because these are infiltrative tumors. And the timing of adjuvant chemoradiation is under investigation. It has been for 20 years. Uh, do you do it now? Do you do it later? Do you do it uh, concurrent? Do you do it sequential? Those are uh, ongoing 
uh, questions that are, are not well um, answered in the literature to date, although the clinical trials uh, are accruing. And so here's a, a grade two um, glioma of the brainstem of the cervical medullary junction. And this is an ependymoma. It's a pretty typical location for uh, an ependymoma. And um, it arose from the ependymal cells of the fourth ventricle and impaginated into the brainstem. And, um, and he had presented with dysphagia. Thankfully, this lesion had a really uh, nice plane to the brainstem. And so he underwent surgical resection of this and, uh, and had a gross total resection and neurologically improved and gained 30 pounds post-op and was up and walking and working and had his peg tube removed. It's, it's not always the case, but ependymomas in general uh, can have nice planes to the surrounding even critical uh, neural structures. This is a, a more typical grade two uh, glioma that you might see in a young person. This is a frontoinsular uh, glioma. And, um, and you can see on the flare sequence that this is uh, uh, large and in the insula and in the basal frontal lobe and involving the ACAs and uh, displacing the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And, uh, and then on the contrast enhanced imaging, there's no uh, discernible contrast enhancement. And this patient had an awake craniotomy for resection and had a transylvian approach up to the tumor and, uh, and had a good extent of resection and has done well neurologically thus far. And so even some of these challenging tumors, I think if you can uh, piece together a strategy uh, to, to do something more than biopsy for, for most low-grade gliomas that is in the patient's benefit. This is a, another sort of classic appearance of a low-grade glioma. So this is CT scan, of course, and this is areas of calcification within an area of hypodensity. And then on the flare sequence, you can see the full extent of the tumor, uh, at least radiographically. And then on the post-contrast imaging, you can see areas of patchy enhancement. This is a transforming oligo, grade three oligodendroglioma in a patient who presented with a seizure. Uh, and, and so the management for this, the appropriate management is surgical resection of both the non-enhancing disease and the enhancing disease, uh, both. And, and where does this sort of uh, strategy of, of more aggressive uh, surgical resection of gliomas come from? There's actually good data to support this. So 20 years ago, patient, uh, physicians, surgeons were much more uh, reluctant to operate on low-grade gliomas. And, um, and because we know that there are often normal uh, uh, neural structures and, and fiber pathways that cross through low-grade tumors uh, as opposed to high-grade tumors. And so uh, there was significant concern for uh, neurologic debility and the mapping strategies weren't as mature. And so there's uh, a much more of a watch and wait or biopsy only approach to low-grade gliomas. But uh, there was a group before my time who uh, thought that early surgical inter intervention might be better for this patient population. And, um, you know, sort of famous people in the U.S. who've been uh, pushing for this are like Mitch Berger, for example, who made his uh, made a large part of his name on this uh, body of work. And so in the U.S., it's very hard to have uh, randomized controlled trials uh, for biopsy versus surgery. But in Scandinavia, uh, where healthcare is much more uh, centralized, um, patients sort of get what the hospital that they're assigned to uh, most often does. And so in Norway, there were two uh, hospitals, one served the northern part of the country, one served the southern part of the country. And in one hospital, they preferred resection, and the other, they preferred a biopsy, uh, watchful waiting strategy. And, and because they have a national healthcare system, their data uh, was uh, captured and monitored for many years. And so uh, this was published in JAMA in 2012, but it showed clearly that the patients who had the more aggressive upfront surgical approach did better in terms of overall survival uh, compared to biopsy only. And then that same group followed uh, those patients and, and published an update in the Annals of Oncology in 2017 and showed so this uh, original study went out to 10 years and, and then the follow-up went out to 14 years of data that in Region A, uh, biopsy preferred the median survival is 5.8 years versus region B with early resection, the median survival is 14.4 years. And so this really represents the strongest body of data uh, in support of early surgical intervention for low-grade gliomas.
And then that uh, same group in that same Annals of Oncology manuscript uh, tried to see if the surgical benefit was specific to a certain type of low-grade glioma IDH mutant versus IDH wild type, which we might now consider high-grade gliomas in, in the new C-impact now uh, classifications. But, but nevertheless, at the time of this publication, they stratified them into low-risk, medium-risk, high-risk based on um, whether you were an IDH mutated oligo, IDH mutated astrocytoma, or IDH wild type glioma. And independent of the molecular features, early surgical uh, intervention uh, was of benefit in all three groups. If we go to grade four gliomas, uh, the common types are glioblastoma, of course, which again is the most common um, malignant brain tumor, uh, primary malignant brain tumor. And, and by definition, now glioblastomas need to be IDH wild type. If you're IDH mutant, then you're an anaplastic astrocytoma and you halt there. And if you're uh, if you're 1P19 co-deleted, then you're an anaplastic oligodendroglioma and you halt your grading there. So glioblastoma now means IDH wild type. Um, so this sort of idea of the secondary GBM with IDH mutation is falling away. And then you can also be a grade four glioma if you're an HCK27 and mutated glioma, but only if you're in the midline, not if you're found elsewhere. Presentation here uh, can be seizure and headache, but often there's focal neurologic deficits. These are disruptive uh, and fast moving lesions. And so often there's more fixed deficits uh, than patients with low grade gliomas. These are infiltrating, almost always contrast enhancing. And surgical goal traditionally has been a gross total resection of the enhancing disease if you can maintain the KPS while doing so. But there's some newer data that suggests that resection of the non-contrast enhancing disease may also be an appropriate uh, target uh, if feasible. And so I'll show you that data. It's from Mitch Berger's group and was published in the last year. Uh, surgery is uh, absolutely not curative and post op chemo RT is required and typically started at three to four week time frame after surgery. And so this is a pretty common uh, grade four glioma. This is a glioblastoma butterfly GBM of the splenium of the corpus callosum. Uh, and this is in an otherwise very healthy uh, young man in the last six weeks. And so although it was a butterfly GBM, given that the uh, preponderance of tumor was in one hemisphere, uh, we opted to, to proceed with a more aggressive surgical approach um, and resect the lesion as opposed to biopsy alone. And he uh, thus far has done well with that. This is one of those H3K27N mutant uh, thalamic astrocytoma and who uh, presented with headache, but otherwise was neurologically uh, pretty well. And, um, and after looking at his uh, neurologic exam and the location of this tumor and the size and the functional MRI um, results, I thought that an aggressive surgical approach could be done safely in him. And, and in fact, he uh, did well with surgery and was back to work full time at six weeks. Um, and he ultimately passed to this tumor. It's, again, it's not curative, but he lived for about two, two and a half years where the median survival for these lesions is about 12 to 14 months. So I do believe that surgery uh, likely played a role in improving his survival. This is a, a, not a glioma, this is a medulloblastoma, so it's a neuroepithelial tumor, but in the uh, PNET category. But I put this up here to say that uh, even in the adult practice, every now and then you will see uh, medulloblastomas, midline lesions in the posterior fossa, typically, unless it's a desmoplastic medulloblastoma, in which it might uh, be in the cerebellar hemispheres. And so we should be on the lookout for this, uh, even uh, if you have a predominantly adult practice. And these lesions are most often midline. They have uh, areas of avid contrast enhancement typically, but their biggest uh, feature that sort of separates them from other uh, posterior fossil lesions uh, in the adult world is that they restrict diffusion avidly. And so this is really, you can make the diagnosis here radiographically just on the basis of these two films. And I said that in general, historically, and certainly how I was taught in residency, the goal of uh, GBM or grade four glioma operation is resection of the contrast enhancing disease. Uh, but Mitch Berger's uh, group published this paper in JAMA Oncology last year that looked uh, to see if resection of non-contrast enhancing tumor was also associated with improved survival. I won't get into the details of all of their different groups um, as they parse the data uh, quite a bit. 
But the long story short is that in this manuscript, they say that for patients that are 65 and younger, resection of both the contrast enhancing and non uh, contrast enhancing tumor uh, provides a service, uh, survival benefit. Uh, so uh, if you have a GBM patient and you're looking at the latest data, you should uh, be thinking about whether there's a portion of the non contrast enhancing tumor that can be removed uh, safely without new neurologic deficit um, because this manuscript says that patients will do better. Now, I haven't fully adopted this yet into my practice because, frankly, most of the time the flare signal and non contrast enhancing disease is an eloquent uh, brain, and I don't think it's safe to remove. But every now and then you might see a right frontal GBM that has some uh, flare that goes beyond the uh, contrast enhancement. You may be able to eliminate both portions of the tumor, and you should think about that. I'm going to hit on some of the sort of major uh, manuscripts that have um, influenced the current th uh, treatment of glioblastomas, uh, mostly for the residents to have in their knowledge base. And so uh, we talk about the current um, chemo radiation protocol for GBM patients. We call that the STUP protocol after Roger Stoop, S-T-U-P-P. And this is the article that came out that basically said radiation plus temozolomide, which is an alkylating chemotherapy, is better than radiation alone. This came out in 2015, and it moved the overall survival, or uh, the median survival, excuse me, on the order of two and a half months. And so just on the basis of this, temozolomide was approved, and now it's, you know, the chemotherapy of choice for a glioblastoma. And so um, you know, it's great that it's an oral chemotherapy. It's great that it's overall well tolerated, but it also shows you uh, how little progress really has been made. The a therapeutic that uh, improves the median survival by two and a half months is sort of met with such fanfare and published in the New England Journal and becomes standard of care. It's a uh, pretty low bar. But so this is the big Kappa Meyer curve from uh, Stoop's original uh, manuscript that leads to current standard of care. There's a uh, additional compendium article in that um, uh, edition of the New England uh, of the New England Journal by uh, Heggie, who's uh, Stoops um, collaborator, and they subdivided uh, glioblastomas into those who had the MGMT promoter methylated and those who had it unmethylated. And this is a question that actually comes up on the neurosurgery written boards, and so it's important to know this data. So MGMT is an enzyme that reverses the effect of temozolomide. Temozolomide goes and puts alkyl groups on the O6 position of benzoguanine, and by doing that creates DNA damage that then interferes with replication. And MGMT is this uh, DNA repair enzyme that goes and takes all those alkyl groups off, so it reverses the effect of uh, temozolomide. If you're methylated, then your MGMT is silenced in the tumor cells, and so temozolomide can work more uh, efficiently and, and there's better tumor kill. If you're unmethylated, then MGMT is in there reversing the action of temozolomide. And there's been clinical trials uh, to try to infuse O6-benzylguanine in patients to see if you can sort of give another substrate for the uh, intact MGMT to work on, but they have a lot of toxicities. And so, uh, this data is important. You'll need to know it for the written boards. It's important because when we get MGMT promoter methylation analysis, we can tell the patient something meaningful about uh, prognosis. And also because patients that have uh, methylated MGMT promoters are more often uh, those that have pseudoprogression during the early phases of treatment. And so if you see a big angry lesion at months four to eight, um, after uh, surgical resection, but the MGMT promoter is methylated, it's probably pseudoprogression, not true progression, and you can sort of weight that out. So these are uh, important nuances for GBM management. We talk a lot about IDH mutations uh, in tumor board, and the uh, group here, the research group here, has significant interest in these. Uh, this is some of the original work that was published in the New England Journal in 2009, looking at the frequency of IDH mutations in uh, various tumors. And so you can see in primary adult glioblastomas, this is before the current WHO update. All of this has influenced the current WHO update. But basically, in primary adult uh, GBMs, you don't see the IDH mutation. In secondary GBMs, you do. We don't even call these GBMs anymore. 
And then in all these oligodendrogliomas and uh, lower grade astrocytomas, you often see IDH mutations. And so uh, this uh, work uh, influenced the current WHO classification. And in the old days when we would subclassify glioblastomas as IDH mutated versus IDH wild type, IDH mutated tumors, as we all know, do much better. And the same holds for IDH mutated anaplastic astrocytomas. This is just a better uh, molecular tumor. If we, I want to talk a little bit now about some of the more, uh, not necessarily controversial, but newer treatments for high grade gliomas um, that you may see your patients uh, uh, using or asking you about. And so uh, the Optune device or tumor treating fields is that device where these sticky electrical um, pads are placed on a patient's clean shaven scalp and then uh, alternating uh, medium frequency, 200 kilohertz uh, electrical impulses are sent across uh, these uh, arrays. And the idea is that, that um, electrical stimulation interferes with microtubule assembly and stabilization. And so it's a cytotoxic agent that way for cells that are in division. And this uh, manuscript was published in JAMA in 2015. I think Brett discussed it in a tumor board back in the day. Um, and so it showed that you know, patients who were treated with tumor treating fields, uh, Optune device uh, with temozolomide versus temozolomide alone had improvements in both PFS and OS. Now these improvements were on the order of one to three months. It's not, it's not a game changer. Although if you were playing devil's advocate, you'd say temozolomide didn't do that much better uh, when it was added to radiation. And so all of these incremental gains are still gains. But the cost to the patient is that they have to shave their head and wear this device for 22 hours a day. And so it's not uh, not insignificant, especially uh, for women. Incidentally, uh, this company just, I think, got approval to use this device like a clinical trial was halted early because of positive results for lung cancer. And so if this becomes mainstream treatment for something like lung cancer, uh, many people think this might bankrupt Medicare if it's very expensive. Um, but also we're going to see a lot more of this, a lot more lung cancer in the world than uh, gliomas. And then bevacizumab or Avastin, uh, when I was a resident, was going to be this uh, game changer and uh, totally uh, uh, revolutionize the survival for GBM patients. They were using it all the time for recurrent uh, glioblastoma patients and sometimes in the upfront setting as well. And bevacizumab is a VEGF inhibitor, and so the idea is that you clamp down all the blood vessels that are feeding the tumor, and then the tumor dies, and it's amazing. And the initial MRIs after you give a patient Avastin are amazing uh, because it does um, sort of uh, make the blood-brain barrier more intact. It prevents the leakiness, and so all the contrast enhancement, a lot of it goes away. And so early on, uh, physicians thought that they had a real home run here and that the tumor was disappearing. Uh, but then as they followed these patients, they all uh, tended to pass at the same interval uh, that those who were getting SIBO or not this at all. And, um, and, and it turned out that bevacizumab was just masking the contrast enhancement. But if you looked at the flare images, all of the tumor was still there, just sort of behind this uh, curtain of Avastin, but there and active. And so uh, Bev didn't really improve the OS or progression-free survival. And so for that reason, uh, it's not standard of care for recurrent glioma. But the sort of silver lining out of all of this, this is like a, a sort of point of sadness in neuro-oncology when this, these trials failed. But uh, the silver lining was that the patients who had really refractory and severe uh, cerebral edema uh, got a lot better on BEV and, um, and were able to wean off of steroids. And so now Avastin is used as a steroid sparing agent. We use it in uh, patients who have big gliomas that are right on the edge with their edema, and it really can help and have a, a profound uh, improvement in, in sort of the short term and symptomatic control, but it does not uh, meaningfully influence overall survival. Uh, some of you have seen this, is talking about sort of newer technologies and applications to gliomas. This is a gamma tile wafer. And so gamma tile is a relatively newer technology. This is basically a durigen wafer that has uh, four cesium-131 seeds implanted into them. So this is a form of brachytherapy. 
And they've used cesium-131 for a long time for brachytherapy applications elsewhere in the body, most notably prostate cancer. And so there's been uh, a push, this was I think developed at Barrow originally, to try to line the resection cavities of malignant tumors uh, with these tiles as a form of intracavitary uh, brachytherapy for better uh, high dose delivery to the at-risk brain um, and sort of one-stop shop. You do the surgery, you put the tiles in, they don't have to come back later for gamma eye for external beam or, or whichever else uh, modality of radiation you think might serve them best. And so, so this you'll see, uh, I suspect, more and more in the recurrent glioma space. And, and there is a trial ongoing for using it upfront also. An issue with this is that most of the dose fall off is in the first five millimeters. And we know that in glioblastoma, the at-risk brain is far greater than that. I mean, the at-risk brain is really the whole brain. But when we do traditional external beam radiation strategies, you usually um, have dose fall off that's pretty significant over the first two centimeters, uh, including all of the flare. And so this wouldn't adequately address this but in the recurrent setting where you don't have your upfront radiation option available, I think this makes some sense. And certainly where this is being used more often is um, brain metastases that either have failed gamma knife or are multiply uh, recurrent despite uh, surgery. And, and we know that metastases in general infiltrate much uh, less into the brain. They are more uh, sort of uh, locally destructive. And so if you could cover five millimeters of the brain with high dose radiation with a gamma tile, that might make some therapeutic sense. I also personally think this would be great for atypical or anaplastic meningiomas. Um, those are not as common, but I think that this kind of technology could find a home there. Other surgical tools you guys have seen, uh, Dr. Abdullah used 5-ALA a lot, and there's a lot of literature in support of uh, using this uh, for fluorescence guidance fluorescence guided uh, surgery for high grade gliomas. And so 5-ALA is a pro drug that a patient uh, drinks. It's uh, dissolved into solution and that's, it gets integrated into the heme pathway and break, broken down into a porphyrin. And so it, um, it is uh, fluorescent and can be seen with uh, violet blue excitation. And so you have a patient and it's preferentially taken up in uh, areas with blood brain barrier breakdown and high grade glial, uh, glioma cells. And so a patient drinks this and then, um, and then it gets taken up into the tumor. And then while you're operating, you switch between traditional white light uh, microscopy and uh, over to fluorescence microscopy and the tumor uh, under that wavelength will emit a pink signal. The most annoying part, I think, of this technology is that you're constantly sort of flipping back between violet blue light and, and white light, and so you can't see all of the normal anatomy when you're in the 5-ALA mode. Um, but I am told by the, um, by the manufacturers that they are working with the microscope uh, companies to uh, create basically a digital overlay of the 5-ALA signal onto the white light. Uh, image and maybe that'll come out in the next year or so and so you won't be constantly flipping back and forth and that would be awesome and i think that the next big upgrade in this technology would be if you could find a way to increase the improve the signal to noise ratio such that you could see 5 ala uh, in low-grade gliomas which really blend into the brain are really difficult to discern from the normal surrounding brain especially at the margins right now the signal to noise at the current doses of 5 ala administration are not good enough to detect it on microscopy, although you can later post hoc in the tissue itself. But if they could improve that, I think that would be a real game changer for low grade gliomas. And this is uh, uh, data from the trial that was published in 2006 by uh, Dr. Stomrush Group in Europe, who's uh, been the a big, the big advocate for 5-ALA technology for 20 years that showed that uh, patients who had a 5-ALA guided surgery in general uh, the data not shown is uh, higher rates of uh, gross total resection, and then this table shows uh, higher rates of progression-free survival um, in that cohort. And so uh, 5-ALA is now FDA approved in the U.S. over the last uh, several years and available um, for all of us to use at clinics. Other surgical tools, I'll try to keep this brief as we're coming up on the hour. 
Um, but we have uh, an intraoperative MRI, and although we don't have all our brain lab uh, registration equipment to make this super convenient yet, uh, intraoperative MRIs are particularly useful for confirming extent of resection or re-registering once you've had a lot of brain shift after resection of a, of a big glioma. And so you guys all see this in practice as residents over the coming years. Um, it adds time to the operation, but you can eliminate a post-operative MRI in most uh, cases. So it's nice for the patient. And, um, and if you can update the registration and move from a 90% extent of resection to 100% extent of resection, that's probably worth it, uh, worth the time uh, invested. This is a paper that was published out of uh, China in Neurosurgical Focus five years ago. Uh, they really had, were early adopters of the intraoperative MRI and had uh, big patient numbers early uh, in, in the course. And what they basically showed was that there mean final extent of resection. So group A, group B. Group A is uh, the first 57 cases that were done with intraoperative MRI in their cohort, and group B was the next 49 cases done with intraoperative MRI. So all these patients had intraoperative MRI. But what it showed was that at the end, they're in the first 50 patients and the second 50 patients, they achieved similar extensive resection and, and gross total resection rates but their short-term and long-term neurologic deficits went down and their rate of uh, opening the head up and resecting more went down. And so this data here suggests to me that having an intraoperative MRI is a powerful learning tool um, and it makes surgeons better. Um, you get the same extensive resection, you have lower rates of deficit, higher, lower rates of having to go back uh, after your MRI sort of trains your eye uh, to see the tumor and understand uh, safe uh, points uh, better. And so, so sometimes, you know, the naysayers of intraoperative MRI will say, well, you're using it as a crutch and then you'll never, you'll never be able to get better because you're always relying on an MRI to help you. But this data suggests that, in fact, these surgeons did get better by having the tool and then were able to accomplish the same things that they were in the first 50 patients with, uh, with less re-resection, et cetera. I don't want to get into mapping because I think this will take uh, too long. Uh, we only have a few more minutes, but um, you guys know that we do a lot of mapping here. We do a wake mapping, we do a sleep mapping, we do bipolar uh, stimulation mapping, we do monopolar stimulation mapping, we do cortical mapping, and we do subcortical mapping. And so maybe uh, for a future lecture, we can talk about all the nuances of monopolar versus bipolar stimulation, subcortical versus cortical how you assess uh, proximity to uh, uh, fiber tracks and things like this. But suffice it to say that surgical tools mapping is important for gliomas. Uh, here's a case that highlights that point. This is a patient who is 30 years out from his original diagnosis of a glioma. So he had a big left frontal resection. The guy was neurologically perfect. He had a PhD. And then 30 years later, he developed this recurrence. And if you look, you think, you know, this is taking up half of his hand area and, and and just based on principles of neuroanatomy that we learned in medical school, this is sort of a no-go in terms of resection. Uh, but, you know, this is 40 years of evolution, and, and he presented with some hand weakness. But, in fact, after his resection, his hand weakness got better, and uh, he was able to write again. And um, his mapping intraoperatively showed that uh, uh, much of his motor pathway uh, had in this area in particular had uh, moved and, and reorganized. And so uh, mapping is an important tool for gliomas. And just because you see this doesn't mean it's not resectable. You put it into context of how long the gliomas has been there growing, et cetera. 